in Somalia, I definitely know of smugglers who go on social media, who go on Facebook to try to recruit potential migrants. They speak to youth and try to convince them to leave. So it's true that in some cases they can generate a demand, but in most cases they don't. So the reason why we hear more and more about the smuggler is because it's become the face of a problem. Uh, for European governments, it's easier to demonize a smuggler than to demonize a refugee or a migrant. So it's very useful to have a face to put on a problem. It's, it's highly likely that by doing so, you can more easily um, push uh, policies against, against migration and irregular migration. But beyond what we hear in the media and beyond what we hear from the governments, which is usually that smugglers are criminals, uh, that they're predators, that they're dangerous, that it's like a mafia, what we need to look at is the country of origin perspective. In those countries, um, smuggling is not a big economic or criminal organization. It's not an organized crime. It's actually a social practice. There's a social organization behind smuggling. From Afghanistan to Somalia, everyone will tell you in their neighborhood, in their village, in their city that they know of a smuggler. The smuggler is a distant relative, a friend, somebody they've known for years. The smuggler can be a returnee who's come back and his only job and his only way to use his migration in any positive way is to help others get through the migration journey. They prefer to call themselves travel agents, helpers, handlers. People, migrants, prefer to refer to them as their brothers. One uh, Somali migrant whom I spoke with uh, told me that the smuggler is their passport. When their real passport doesn't give them access to countries, smugglers do. So there's a positive image of the smuggler, the one that is helping migrants leave situations that they need to leave. So it's very different from the discourse we hear here in Europe. In Somalia, I definitely know of smugglers who go on social media, who go on Facebook to try to recruit potential migrants. They speak to youth and try to convince them to leave. So it's true that in some cases they can generate a demand, but in most cases they don't. In most cases they don't recruit, they respond to a demand. So let's take um, one uh, case study of a smuggler who I met in Afghanistan and let's call him Shingul. Shingul uh, started working as a smuggler uh, because he had no other job to do in Afghanistan. He was himself a refugee in Pakistan. He then became a migrant in Iran. So he lived in all those countries in the region close to Afghanistan through which people have to go through to get to Europe. When he came back to Afghanistan, uh, he had no other job. He decided to start helping out some friends to get to Iran for work. Then from Iran to help them get to Europe. Little by little, he started organizing the journeys for them. Uh, he did it physically, going with them through the borders. He got arrested in Iran, ended up being in prison for four years. That deterred him from doing it physically, but he continued managing smuggling routes uh, just on his phone through SMS. For him, it was a way of helping people out of the misery that they were in in Afghanistan. It was also a way for him to provide for his family. He did not want to do this job, and for him, it had a shameful component to him. He was ashamed of being a smuggler, but he did it because he did feel that it was responding to a demand that he was providing a service. Smugglers can, of course, be criminals. They can be harmful to migrants. And usually that happens when the connection to the first smuggler, to the smuggler that they knew, the smuggler from their community, is lost. And when is that connection lost? The harder the journey gets, the harder, the stricter uh, the borders get, that connection with the community gets lost. So smuggling is a means to protect migrants when those from their community smuggle them all the way, let's say, to, to Europe. But that doesn't usually happen like that. Along the way, uh, because of restrictive policies, migrants find themselves in the hands of new smugglers. 
And those new smugglers are not from their same ethnicity, not from the same country, not from the same community. So they don't have their best interest in mind. Uh, in the cases of unaccompanied minors or women traveling far from their homes, they can fall into very um, abusive practices with smugglers of other countries, of border areas that they do not know. Smugglers are not what is causing migration. What is causing migration in irregular ways is the fact that they have no regular ways to migrate. Today, if you're an Afghan wanting to go to the UK, you have to actually put your um, visa application in Islamabad. Now that's a hurdle uh, that's very difficult. You have to go to Pakistan to be able to, to make your demand to go uh, to the UK. So why not have that legal pathway available in Afghanistan for people to be able to put their visa claims to, uh, to the local consulate? The access to legal recourses is very complicated for Afghans. Um, and it is the same in other countries around the world. So providing legal ways just means more simply to make visas accessible and demands for visas accessible to all.